Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing cellular necrosis, the first part of a two-part series on this topic. As always, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because your support really means a lot to us and we really appreciate it. So with that being said, let's discuss cell injury and then we're going to dive into cell necrosis and the types of necrosis you need to know. The cell can get damaged, uh, can get injured in many ways, but essentially when stress is placed upon a cell, our cells are able to adapt to a certain level of stress no matter what through certain mechanisms like hyperplasia, hypertrophy, and metaplasia. Pretty basic stuff, right? And when the level of stress placed upon a cell exceeds the cell's ability to adapt, you are going to have cellular injury occur. Very, very basic. All of this is going to depend on the range of the injury and the type of stress placed upon it. Essentially, that's very, you know, rudimentary level that you need to know. Depending on what's happening and what type of stress is placed upon a cell, the injury is going to vary. And there are two main mechanisms. Essentially, you have a reversible cellular injury. That's the first stage where you're going to see cellular swelling. And then the second stage is irreversible membrane, uh, irreversible damage, where you're going, to, you're going to have membrane damage occurring, not just to the cell, but also to the mitochondria and the lysosomal membranes as well. This is a schematic you need to remember and just commit to your mind. We're going through this really quickly because we've talked about this in a previous video on our channel, but for now, commit this schematic into your mind. When you have a normal cell and it gets damaged because it's having too much stress placed upon it, you're going to get reversible cellular injury. And the reason why it's called reversible is because of the, this bidirectional error where you can actually go back to a normal cell state in this injury phase. But once you continue having a uh, an excessive amount of stress placed upon this cell, this reversible cell injury phase is then, then going to progress to the irreversible cell injury phase. And once you get to this phase, no matter what, you are going to have cell death occur. You cannot avoid it. It is going to happen. All right. So when it comes to cell necrosis, you need to understand that this is cell death occurring at a large scale, right? This is not a micro level. This is a macro level death that is occurring. It's happening across a large scale of cells, not just individual cells. That would be apoptosis. In this case, you're going to see an exogenous cell injury that's occurring. Something from outside of the cell is damaging the cell and it's leading to uncontrolled cellular degradation. The cells are breaking down. And the reason why it's uncontrolled is that the normal cellular enzymes that you have that are responsible for apoptosis, aka programmed or controlled cell death, are actually inactivated. They are shut off, right? Those enzymes are no longer wor working. This is going to be due to some underlying pathologic condition that's going on. So, for example, if you think about a thrombus forming, it's going to cause ischemia. Now, it's not the actual thrombus that's causing a large-scale die-off of cells. It's actually the ischemia. And that ischemia is a pathologic process that's leading to the exogenous injury happening in the you know example of a thrombus that's leading to ischemia. The key principles you need to remember is that when this damage occurs, the cells are going to end up breaking and they're going to release their interest cellular component. Pretty straightforward, right? You have an exogenous injury occurring upon these cells. These cells get lysed or they get broken up and they open up. And when they open up, their intracellular components will get released. Some of those intracellular components are very, very damaging to the nearby cells. Those are going to be things that are in lysosomes or uh, peroxisomes, right? Lys lysosomes, peroxisomes, peroxisomes. The lysozymes and the peroxizymes, the enzymes that are within these organelles are going to be released and that's going to cause a presence of inflammation. Very important in necrosis, you are going to have inflammation occur. In apoptosis, there's not going to be inflammation really occurring because it's already programmed. The cell knows it's going to die. Now, there are several different types of necrosis you need to be aware of for your exams. The ones we're going to talk about in this part one is going to be coagulative, liquefactive, and caseous necrosis because these all kind of relate next to each other. They're very important. The rest are going to be discussed in part two, which is gangrenous, fibrinoid, and uh, fat necrosis. So let's just dive right in and let's talk about coagulative necrosis. Coagulative necrosis is when you're going to have necrotic tissue that is still firm. Very, very important. This is usually happening because of some sort of thrombus or some sort of coagulation that's occurring that's going to cause the cells to die off after the coagulation. All right. Now, this usually is going to occur in solid organs like the heart, the kidney, or the liver. Just keep in mind of a thrombus forming. And when you think about a thrombus, what are the organs that are most likely going to be affected? Usually it's the heart, right? That's the number one organ you think about in my mind. Then I think about the kidney and then I think about the liver. 
pretty straightforward. And what ends up happening in coagulative necrosis is that the cells that are getting killed off uh, are getting killed off because of a lack of usually perfusion. But at the end of the day, the cell shape is going to actually be preserved because of the coagulation of the cell protein. And if the cell shape is preserved, usually the organ shape is also going to be preserved. Often this is going to happen due to an ischemic infarction, not in the brain though, this is the exception, okay? We're going to talk about what happens in the brain in a second, but in these types of organs, like solid organs, you're going to see an ischemic infarction happening because usually it's going to happen in a blood vessel and a thrombus is going to form because of the coagulate the coagulation cascade is probably going to get activated or it's going to be an embolus but essentially a thrombus or some sort of blockade is going to happen in the artery it could even happen in the vein and when that happens you're going to see necrosis happening in the tissue distal or downstream to the coagulation usually the area is going to be a uh, the area of uh, infarction is going to have a wedge shape and it's going to be pale why is it going to have a wedge shape? Well, usually these types of coagulations or this these types of infarctions occur at branch points. Let's say this is an artery and here's a branch point and you block off something, uh, you block off this artery before the branching occurs. When you do that, all of this area right here is not being perfused. That means because this part of the vessel is not actually giving oxygen to the tissue surrounding it, you're going to get a wedge-shaped infarct like this. Now, later on, you're going to see some anastomosis coming in, so the rest of the tissue might not be perfused, or might, might be normally perfused and will have adequate oxygen supply, but you are going to get this classic wedge-shaped uh, um, necrosis occurring. Usually, the injury is going to denature enzymes and proteolysis is going to be blocked. And the histological characterizations that you need to know is that number one, the cellular architecture is preserved. Okay, that is preserved. The nucleus is going to disappear. That is very important. We've talked about how the nucleus goes away from uh, pycnosis to karyorexis to karyolysis, right? That nucleus disappearing happens. And then you're going to see an increase in the cytoplasmic binding of eosin stain, right? Uh, you're going to see a red or pink color when you look at the, the histological uh, uh, the his histology side, excuse me. So this is an example of coagulative necrosis. As you can see in these photos, the nuclei of these cells in the kidneys are not there anymore. Some of these cells have nuclei, but the rest of the nuclei are kind of disappearing. They're not there. At the same time, you see all this pink material right here, which is the eosin uh, stain that's coming out positive. And as you can see, the architecture is still preserved, right? The whole gl glomerulus glomerulus there you go the, the glomeruli are still they look the same it's not like you don't you can't tell that's a glomerulus it's just that it, they are not functioning properly at the same time you have cells that are already dead because they have no nucleus okay the nucleus is gone that is what coagulative necrosis looks like on a pathologic side now, the next type of necrosis is liquefactive necrosis, and I like to think of liquefactive necrosis as the complete opposite, as far as the gross appearance is concerned, of coagulative necrosis. Essentially, the hallmark is that the tissue is going to be soft, right? In coagulative necrosis, you had hard tissue. In liquefactive necrosis, you're going to have soft tissue. Usually, this is going to occur in the soft organs, right? The hard organs or the solid organs like the kidneys, the liver, the brain, uh, the, the heart have coagulative necrosis. Liquefactive necrosis, hallmark tissue is the brain. Very important. The brain goes through liquefactive necrosis. I've said that like five times, so I'm just going to write high yield AF so you don't forget that. Essentially, what ends up happening in this type of necrosis is that enzyme lysis is going to occur as well as uh, a destruction of the surrounding proteins. And this is going to be seen in three main instances. Number one, you're going to see a brain infarct. If you have a stroke or if you have some type of infarction happening in the brain, you're going to see liquefactive necrosis happening later on. Abscesses also are going to cause liquefactive necrosis because of the enzymes that neutrophils actually release. These enzymes released by neutrophils are going to cause the, the actual surrounding architecture to break down and it's going to have a soft consistency. And then finally, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis 
occurs when you have a chronic release of the enzymes and these pancreatic enzymes are usually used to break down certain types of you know uh, proteins and and uh, fats and lipids and because of that because they are enzymes that break things down you're going to see more liquefactive necrosis than any other type of necrosis in the pancreas as well when it comes to the histology essentially it's just general cell debris is happening there are going to be macrophages as well as some cystic spaces or cavitations you might see some fluid spill uh, fluid filled spaces because the tissue is usually soft or the surrounding proteins of the architecture are being broken down and then finally you're going to see neutrophil and cell debris that can happen especially with bacterial infections this is a gross image of what liquefactive necrosis looks like especially in the brain as you can see this part of the tissue is perfectly normal normal but this area this gigantic area doesn't seem like it's normal you can see there are little tiny cystic spaces right and then you have this giant cavitary lesion right there as well so this is one hallmark example of liquefactive necrosis then finally we have caseous necrosis coagulative necrosis i'm just gonna write this down for you guys coagulative necrosis was hard liquefactive necrosis was soft well caseous necrosis is actually something uh, is necrotic tissue that has cottage cheese like appearance essentially it occurs in solid organs like the kidney heart and liver but it's a combination of both coagulative and liquefactive necrosis it occurs in both it has both pathologic findings of coagulative and liquefactive necrosis this is usually due to infection so this is what you need to remember for caseous necrosis is an infection very important now there are several different infections that can cause this like tb histoplasma histoplasma capsulatum nocardia all of these can cause caseous necrosis think about these types of organisms and just imagine cheese with them that's how I remembered it. Just imagine cheese. And the macrophages, what ends up happening, usually wall off the infecting microorganisms. So let's say you have some sort of microorganisms right here, right? And they're just floating around infecting your tissues. Well, you're going to see macrophages that are going to wall off the organism like this. And when they wall it off, you're going to have granular debris form and that's going to lead to a cottage cheese like appearance and consistency the histologic changes is going to be a granuloma right so in tb you know tbs have granulomas you've heard about that as well as with nocardia you can get a granuloma occur these are fragmented cells where the debris is surrounded by lymphocytes and macrophages. So let's say these cells are breaking up. You're going to have debris, but these are this debris is going to be surrounded by both macrophages and lymphocytes. And this is what caseous necrosis looks like in a gross appearance. As you can see, it isn't completely hard but it's also not soft like liquefactive necrosis it's kind of in the middle it does look like it's cottage cheese right so that's how i always just remember it and with that being said that's pretty much everything you need to know for the first three types of necrosis thank you so much for watching this video don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you enjoyed it and we'll see you here real soon